this is measuring live, this is measuring oil differential pressure. You will see that every time liquid is coming back, this gauge will drop down. So lubrication is at risk. Let me play the movie. So you can see oil pressure going down and foaming in the side glass, typical indication that liquid is coming back, down and then up. So that's when that liquid yes. is making its way into the compressor. Correct. Down again and then up again. Why this happens? Because CO2 is a great detergent, is a great cleaner. So it flashes away the oil film within the compressor and therefore the oil pump is no longer able to develop a correct pressure. Welcome to another CO2 Monday. I'm your host Trevor Matthews and welcome to the Refrigeration Mentor podcast. Today is really a great day because we're going to be talking about my favorite topic compressors on top of that we're going to be talking about co2 which i love talking about as well and we're going to be diving deep on compressors today because i have one of the most experienced maybe one of the smartest guys in compressors on the planet which i'm super excited about and uh, we're going to dive in deep on uh, durain compressors giacomo welcome to co2 mondays how you doing brother hi everyone and thank you very much, Trevor, for inviting me today. Well, this has been a long time coming because we've been in conversation for a couple of months now, and you're just such a busy man traveling all over <laughs> the world, talking about compressors and just kicking ass. And I, I love it. And I love seeing uh, more and more uh, consistently. We, we have communications on social media. We've been chatting and I can consistently see you more and more. Like, and I see Doreen more and more globally. And I don't know a lot about uh, Doreen. So... That's why I'm real excited about ta talking with you today. Um, why don't we dive in first of all, give the audience an introduction about uh, your experience with CO2 as well as Durain for those who don't um, know Durain or about Durain. Absolutely, absolutely. A uh, few words about myself, uh, Giacomo here. I am with Durain since 2003 and uh, so it's about 19 years now. Uh, that's my second job, which is uh, quite strange, actually, in a career. I started one year doing, uh, I, I am a mechanical engineer, let's say, and uh, I had one year in a global business in uh, General Electric doing uh, turbo machinery. And then the, the year after, I stepped into Dorin in 2003, and from day one, I was uh, working on CO2 compressors in the beginning wow. in the r and leading the qualification process of the compressor platform. And then let's say step-by-step, step, uh, year by year, I turned <clears throat> toward the dark side of the sales, so to say. But uh, let's say my background is technical and I am now uh, overlooking on the um, CO2 uh, business development. And I am responsible for also for the product development itself. Wow, um, a, ma a massive amount of uh, hats you wear. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of. We try our best. And uh, about Dorin, actually, Dorin is a 100% family-owned business. The company is 104 years old. I think it's one of the oldest compressor manufacturer in the world. Um, the shareholders are uh, family members. There is no other shareholders. The headquarters is in Florence, Italy. Uh, you are most welcome to come over and visit us. Uh, we have uh, production in Italy, in Florence, Italy. We have production in Jashan, China for the local market. And we will start production in the uh, United States as well. Uh, we started Dorin USA in 2019, so it is three years now with a large stock of compressors. We now have uh, 500 plus compressors available in, uh, in, uh, in Michigan, and we have now purchased a new building in Tecamsi, 
uh, in a legendary land from a compressor standpoint, I would say. And the plan is to do remanufacturing within the end of this year and to realize a real supply chain within the US. So to be able to start manufacturing in, uh, in Michigan within the next couple of years. Wow, that's gonna uh, the, really help. Like that, that right there alone, because what customers are looking for is quick turnaround times if they need it. And if you're always right. building, if it's in China or if it's in Italy, wherever it's at, there's long lead times. They gotta go on boats and they are, or fly over, which is a bigger expense. And now you're gonna be here. So, so we're gonna see a bigger, uh, bigger turnaround time for that or quicker turnaround time for that. So you'll see a big growth. I would say, see a bigger growth in North America with your compressors. That's awesome. That is awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. But anyway, let's say that uh, day by day, our stock in the U.S. is increasing, and uh, with uh, with that large stock we have in uh, in uh, in Michigan, we are absolutely able to provide a good service already from now. Uh, that's great to hear. So let's let's dive right into it. Like, what applications for um, CO two can you use these compressors? Uh, just commercial, industrial? Is there uh, low temp, medium temp, what are, what are the options? Heat pumps, chillers, like where do you see your compressors today in the field? Right, am, am I able to share my screen? Is yeah, it allowed yeah, or? yeah, go ahead, I'd love you to. Hold on a second, there you go. You should see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's, uh, you're not there on you full go. screen, you're just showing like all the sides. If you wanna do full screen, you can. You managed to see the slides? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very good. So we go from very small unit with single compressor units. On top, you can see a two-stage compressor. Uh, we are the only manufacturer worldwide manufacturing CO2 two-stage transcritical compressor. They are able to handle from low pressure to uh, heat rejection to ambient. So from very low pressure up to the gas cooler pressure in a single compressor and they are used for single compressor cooling unit. They are no longer condensing units, so let me call them gas cooling units, but uh, uh, we range from a very small compressor suitable for this kind of application. Uh, then we have typical rack system for- Let's uh, go back to there. Let's go, let's go back to that compressor because I don't know anything about the, these compressors. I've no not heard about them. So. Can you explain how that works? What, what's happening internally on this compressor? Because you're, it, it's like the compressor is the booster itself. It's a, you know. That's right. Wow. Let me uh, zoom into. Yeah. So basically you can see the compressor have, has two banks. Yep. The housing, the crankcase is in low pressure. So like uh, minus 40 F SST. Uh, the housing is in low pressure and the first bank is compressing from the low pressure to an intermediate pressure level, which is typically the intermediate pressure receiver pressure. Then you have a separate intercooler, which is typically built into the, uh, the gas cooler frame. And then the cooled CO2 goes back and being sucked by the second stage, by the second bank, and then the uh, discharge is rejected into the gas cooler. So it's that's the kind awesome. of uh, integrated booster compressor, yes. Wow, that's a good way to put it, integrated booster compressor. I'm gonna have to look that up because I was actually looking on your website and um, it said um, double, what was it called? Double. Yeah, to stay. Basically now you can use our online tool, which is yeah, a very that. user friendly. That's our web uh, software. You switch to English, you switch to Imperial units. You have two double stage compressors. That's it, double stage. I'm like, what's double stage? I haven't heard of that. A two stage, but you guys call it double stage. Okay. Right. And basically you can choose between a subcritical and transcritical operation and the most used configuration is an open flash tank mm -hmm. and basically an open flash tank looks like that you can click here download information about the configuration system and then you get wow yeah it dives open. right into it yeah 
So basically it's a booster system done with a single compressor. I love that. That's super cool. Man, I learned something already. We're not even 10 minutes in. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Okay, so you so now we have gas cooler uh, units, not condensing units, gas cooler units, cooling units. That's cool. New to me. Mm -hmm. And so have you you got these in the field today? There's uh, manufacturers building these units? Absolutely, yes. Many in Europe and a couple of those also in the in North America. One of these is Kaiser Warren is doing this with our compressors and also Ref Plus in, uh, in Canada. Nice. I know Ref Plus quite well. Awesome. Okay, so that application, that's a new application for me. I'm going to research a bit more on those, the manufacturers that build these. What are the applications you see them in? Typical rack system, supermarket or industrial refrigeration for, I mean, low temperature and uh, medium temperature levels and parallel compressors. And then more and more, what we see happening in Europe is a full integration between the refrigeration loads and HVAC duties and heating duties. This is a typical example of one of our customers from Switzerland. And they are basically making the uh, point of sales completely independent from an energy standpoint with a single rack. The single rack is providing low temperature duty, medium temperature duty, and with parallel compressors, they are doing HVAC, either DX or with a glycol loop. And with heat recovery, they are providing ambient heating during winter and also sanitary hot water if needed for the employees, showers and the like, and for cleaning processes. So they do not have any additional heating system and they do not have any additional HVAC unit. This That's, is what I love about CO2, these technologies right. here, because now we're taking all the different size of refrigeration and HVAC and combine it in one. I, I, I'm excited to see, because I've been talking four or five years, hearing more about it. This is happening, you know, someday you're going to have air conditioning tied into that one system. Now we're seeing it, you know, four or five years later, since I, I heard about it and people said, oh, it can't be done. Nobody's doing it. People are doing it now. I love that. Absolutely. I love that. And Absolutely. so the, these systems here, I, I know we're going to see more and more of them. I know we're going to see more and more of them, uh, full integrated solutions. So what, what other systems will you see them in before we dive into the deep technical stuff? Industrial refrigeration. We do have the largest compressors available in the market when it comes to CO2 transcritical and subcritical applications. So definitely we can see coming solutions like that where a single skid with uh, like 12 compressors is able to deliver up to five megawatt capacity or 17,000 kilo BTU hour. Wow. So this is coming really as an equivalent in an equation together with this and uh, an ammonia package. Yes. Yes, and I see that and because now 12 compressors is better than 30 compressors because I've seen some applications where you get 30 or 40 compressors in that industrial application. Now, since you have the bigger capacity size, you're moving more, um, you get more right. CFH, more capacity, more tonnage. That's going to be a difference when you, you, know, you don't have 30, 40 compressors. So that's impressive. Correct. Correct. Awesome. And so are you seeing a lot of the, those applications out there today? You see that continue to grow? Because that, that compressor came out four years ago. I don't know how long ago, but I remember seeing it coming up four years ago, maybe five years ago. The largest. Yes, not, not immediately with the largest displacement. Okay. We ramped up gradually, but with the same housing. Okay. So step by step, we increased the displacement, keeping the same housing. But clearly the ratio between cost and performance was becoming more and more interesting. Yeah, awesome. That's super cool. That's a nice one. Uh, that's actually the largest CO2 indoor skiing venue worldwide. Wow, I In, didn't even know there was full indoor <laughs> skiing venues. Yeah. That looks pretty cool. In Norway. So anyone who was listening on the podcast, Go on Google and search indoor, uh, largest indoor ski venue in Norway, and you'll see a picture of it. Looks pretty cool. 
right? And so what type of the system would you have in there? Is that a direct system or an indirect system? Do you have glycol? Is it fully CO2? Like how is that? How does DX. that work? It's DX? Yeah. There are a lot of movies also during the building phase. So you can really enjoy that. <laughs> you can find them. If you Google Snow Arena, you will find a lot of Snow stuff. Arena. Nice. Pretty neat application. Then we, we, we supplied compressors for the Winter Olympic Games for the National Skate Speed Skate Oval. Yeah, I had my good oh. friend uh, Ben Wan here uh, from Simcoe, and he talked about this as well. There was like 12 world records, I think it was maybe he said, or 12 Olympic records. I'd have to, I'll have to ask him again. And yeah. that's, that's your compressors in that, in that, in that arena. Correct. Awesome. And there is actually a specific reason for all those world <laughs> records. Then you want to explain it again? W which is not obviously the compressor, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's okay, we no, can say. The, the ice quality, I mean, when you do CO2 uh, directly flowing under the concrete, you, you, you get rid of a heat transfer, and therefore you can have a much better ice quality with a much better performance. And then you do a kind of semi-flooded system. So basically the temperature of the ice is very constant within the pitch. And uh, all, all the athletes were extremely happy about the performance they managed to achieve. I mean, it was really stunning, uh, the comments they made on the ice quality, but this was on paper before. And then it resulted to be a real, uh, a real thing. I mean, not only on paper. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what Benoit said, and I was pretty, pretty. It's pretty cool to hear that that uh, a refrigerant like this is changing the way even sporting events are being being done, and it's right. because of the refrigerant and making that ice that consistent, more consistent temperature across. I love it. I love it. What else? What else do you have? What other uh, applications? Very last one. Because I would like to mention is heat pumps. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Watts Watts Water in US is launching their are they are launching their CO two heat pump, which okay. are which are using our compressors actually, and uh, basically I would like to mention that because we have to decarbonize our economy and our industry, and heat pumps are the way to go. Yeah. And CO2 heat pumps are extremely efficient, especially when it comes to large temperature lift on the water side. And uh, yeah, CO2 has no no equivalent in this kind of application. Yeah, and I've been hearing this more and more for years now. It's going to go that way, and I I'm excited to see it. And I I really think that there's going to it's going to be a massive amount of uh, opportunity out there. So any manufacturer that you're listening out there, here's an opportunity to jump into uh, the CO2 heat pump. Uh, I mean, there's not going to be enough manufacturers developing them, you know, designing them. So uh, start looking into this because this is, uh, these are going to be game changing things, especially the way the world is working today. Yep. yep. Awesome. So, so, so I see the applications that, that you have here. Let's get into some of the technical side of the, the compressors uh, because I worked for a compressor manufacturer before. I, I research a lot of different ones. There's a lot of uh, uniquenesses when you're working with CO2 compressors or well, actually the CO2 refrigerant compared to when you're using uh, HFCs or uh, HCFCs and things like that. What are some of the top things you know you want technicians to understand, say designers and develop, uh, developers that put your compressor in their system to really understand uh, so the compressors last for the longest amount of time. Yep. Let's say, let me start with sharing this one slide. It's a bit commercial. I hope you will pardon me for that. But uh, this basically summarizes all the advantages we are able to offer with our CO2 compressors platform. We go from easy one. Clearly, we have larger displacements available. Yep. If this is a no-brainer. I mean, when you have large refrigeration duties, uh, using our compressors will allow to have a 
uh, a need for much a fraction of, of compressor amount mm -hmm. and a fraction of racks. So it will lead to an immediate cost saving for the end customer. Uh, then we have high efficiency. We have a very low noise level and very low vibration level. Uh, we have extra robustness. We have low te discharge temperature and very low oil carryover. Each of these points can be explained with deep technical uh, argumentation, can be fact-based explained. Uh, there, so there's a lot say, there. Let's get, we'll get into a couple of the points. The ones that I would like to, to really talk about is uh, the low discharge temperature for smaller gas coolers and the oil carryover rate. So that those things I think are really important and what a lot of, it's something I'm still learning on, oil carryover rate and, and that stuff. So right. those are some points that we could dive into if you don't mind. Absolutely. So let's start from low discharge temperatures. Uh, let me start with that. This is a drawing showing a compressor with a cutaway. And uh, what is completely different between our design and competitor design is the use of an external discharge plenum, mm. of an external discharge manifold. I am pointing to that. Can you see my yeah. point? So moving? you have the two heads. So if you look at a standard four cylinder compressor, you get your two heads on each side, but now you have like a casing from each of the heads. So that's kind of what it looks like. Exactly. So Can those are, a, yeah, yeah. Let me show a bad picture. This is a picture from our lab, the one I will show. Because now you have those two heads. So as a, as a discharge and it squishes the last piece of CO2 out, it goes into like a common head. You wouldn't call it header, but a connector out the a discharge, plenum. a plenum. Okay. okay yeah. So basically we tested all our competitors, as you can see here. Yeah. <laughs> we have Emerson, Copeland, yeah. Dorin, Bitzer, Bock, and Fraskold. Yep. And you can immediately understand the difference between our discharge plenum and competitor discharge plenum. So they are all using separate heads yep. while we are using an external plenum. Every compressor needs a plenum a high pressure plenum, a discharge plenum, where the high pressure gas is brought after being compressed, right? Yeah. With our design, we have this volume outside the crankcase. In competitor design, the plenum is inside the crankcase. If you open this compressor from this side, if you take out this plate over here, you will see the casting is made with the discharge plenum collecting the high pressure gas, which then goes out from the discharge service valve. In our case, the situation is completely different. Let me play this animation. I, will ho I hope you will be able to see that. Yep. Can you see an animation coming? Yep. Yeah, so it's a cutaway of the, the compressor itself. Right. Looks like you have an oil pump on it. We get and we go well. step by step inside with a focus on the high pressure side. So what we have here is the high pressure gas on top of the piston flowing through the discharge valve hole and is then collected into this outer volume, into this external plenum, into this external manifold. This is exactly the same execution used in combustion engines. If you look at your engine, and unless you drive a Tesla clearly, but if you open the hook and look at your engine, you will find a separate volume that is collecting the high pressure exhaust gas. Why do you do that? 
you do that because you want to keep the heat out from the drive gear. We know that CO2 is working at much higher temperature than HFCs, especially when running transcritical. So basically we have taken inspiration to combustion engines and we have brought the high pressure, high temperature gas out from the crankcase and far from the lubricant. Mm. How did we do that? We did that with an external plenum. <coughs> Sorry about that. And we have this blue area over here in the presentation that is basically open air circulation. You can put your finger underneath. Okay. This represents a perfect way to separate the high pressure side with the low pressure side. So to get a much lower oil temperature and a much lower discharge temperature. Okay, so if now you... you... Let, let me just yep. show this <coughs> that is maybe better explaining a typical compressor configuration with an internal plenum. And then our CO2 transcritical compressor design with an external plenum. So you can see that the heat, the hot temperature area is much further from the lubricant. And above all, the thermal level of the compressor will be much lower. So you get both lower discharge temperatures <coughs> and lower oil temperatures. Okay. And okay. oil temperature is a strong driver in compressor reliability and longevity. Oil temperature is the most important thing if you, if you wish your compressor is working for eight, 10 or 12 years. If you look at this data, this is the Daniel plot for CO2 and POE85. Are, are you familiar with this chart? No, I think I've heard of it before, but I haven't seen it. <clears throat> this chart are basically showing the miscibility between CO2 and lubricants. In this case, POE85, which is the most common lubricant used with CO2. This chart is showing the residual viscosity of the lubricant when this is within the compressor housing at certain temperature and pressure levels in a CO2 environment. So when you do a comparison in a typical medium temperature operation, suction pressure is equivalent to 14F, discharge pressure 1400 pounds, 18F superheat, with an external manifold, your oil temperature will be approaching 130F, providing a residual viscosity of 16 centistokes. Do you want to just explain centistokes to the audience? Yeah, centistokes is the way you measure oil viscosity. Oil viscosity is indicated by this number, 85 means 85 centistokes, pure oil, 40 degrees C. So it's kind of 110 F. But that's not the viscosity you will have in your compressor. First, because you have CO2, which is miscible with oil, so it's no longer pure oil. And then you have pressure and temperature influence on the residual viscosity. So in our case, when oil temperature is approaching 130 F, the viscosity drop will be from 85 centistokes to 16 centistokes. In a similar design, but without external manifold, the oil temperature will be approaching 160 F and the viscosity will drop down to 10 centistokes. 
Big difference. So basically, with our design, with an external manifold, the lubricant will have 60% higher viscosity. This means much longer lasting compressor. I hope everyone's taking notes on this because my fingers can't go fast enough. <laughs> but that makes so you much more sense. Those lights, I mean, no problem. Yeah. No, no, but it's it's good to understand because oil is, like you said, it's the most important thing in the compressor. And when you start degrading the oil, then that's when the compressor starts to lose its longevity. Correct. And this is not connected to the aging of the oil. It's just from day one, your compressor will work with a much higher viscosity grade. Then temperature comes into place. Because I have been taking this sentence from the oil producer technical bulletin. The exposure of lubricating oils to high temperature for longer periods of time can lead to the formation of decomposition products, which can cause serious problems. Experience shows that an increase in temperature of 10K, which is consistent, doubles the speed of aging. Wow. So having an external discharge manifold helps a lot in keeping the lubricant as it should be. You don't see this in two, three, four years operation, you see this if you want your compressor to work for eight, 10, 12 years. Yeah, and exactly. And that's what compressors are designed for. Um, but you got to make sure that you are properly installing, servicing, <laughs> and maintaining the compressor and having right. a, a lower temperature because it's easy to get that temperature to climb up. If you're not maintaining a system, that temperature can climb up real quickly. And then when you already have like a compressor that can run at lower temperatures, there's a little bit of a, you know, you get a little bit more of a cushion if you're not maintaining the system. But once again, anyone listen, you need to be maintaining these systems properly. Compressors will last a long time. That's awesome. And so that's that plenum. And that's really what the plenum does. It, it, gives you a, a lower oil temperature. Correct. And so in that, do you, uh, in your compressors, do you have some sort of electronics that monitor the discharge temperature or the oil sump temperature or anything like that in, in your compressors? Is there some um, protection devices that you offer either optional or with the compressors? We do offer a high temperature probe which is stopping the compressor when this exceeds 160 degrees C, which equals to 320 F. And this that is, is, is that an internal probe or does that go on the discharge line? Internal probe. Oh, perfect. Yes. It is and, within the plenum. Okay, excellent. And then that would go back to an electronic device or would that go back to, what would that go back to? To the Cree one. To the to okay. a Cree one more. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cree one. Because that's really important. And does that come with the compressor or is that optional with these compressors? Uh, it is an optional. It is an option. So anyone, it doesn't matter what compressor manufactured is, you need to be buying that. I'm telling you right now, if it's an option, you gotta buy it. And most manufacturers have options. So buy that discharge thing to protect the compressor. If you service it, maintain it, and you know, always following up, it, you, you may get away without having it, but it's that extra protection. These compressors are not you know, inexpensive. And having an extra protection that is very minimal cost to protect the compressor is very important. So I highly recommend getting those and looking into those. That's super cool. That's super neat. Thank you. Okay, so, so that's, that's important. We're, we're reducing, we're increasing the life by reducing the oil temperature. Um, let's talk about um, superheat then, because superheat is something that's really important. And in compressor, man, I've, I've read a lot of compressor manufacturers, CO2 compressor manufacturing manuals, and 
what I've learned is that, okay, you know, for your transcritical compressor, you know, you're looking at 10, 10K or 18 Fahrenheit. When you look at subcritical, you're looking at 20K, 36 Fahrenheit, super heat back at the compressor. But when I talk with the technical people from those compressor manufacturers, they say it depends on many factors. Depends on the discharge temperature, depends on the oil sump, depends on the SST. Can we dive into that to, 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 to really give everyone, designers an understanding, technicians an understanding? Because I've talked with the manufacturers uh, that are installing compressors, not compressor manufacturers, the, the OEMs, and they say they can run sometimes compressor lower than what the compressor manufacturers recommends depending on the application and these certain parameters. Can you dive into that? Yeah, I do agree with this approach. Uh, clearly, superheat recommendations are compressor manufacturer dependent. These are our guidelines. Uh, what you see in the left picture is part of our qualification testing. I know this very well because uh, I did that in person, actually. So we, we tested with liquid return. And actually, you have to test with liquid return with CO2. But I'm not meaning big difference. I'm not meaning liquid hammering. This will destroy the compressor. But working wet, little bit wet, little bit inside the refrigerant dome in CO2, it will happen by definition. You will never be able to control your superheat in a perfect way. In a booster system, the transcritical compressor are subject to so strong operating condition fluctuations that it will be simply impossible that you will always have a perfect superheat. So this is why we tested our compressor with a vapor quality, which was very close to saturated condition, but with some liquid coming in. How did we do that? We basically make a bypass, a shortcut from the low part of this receiver, bringing in some liquid toward the compressor suction. Because we know that it will happen. Now, our guidelines are stating that for a dry expansion system, we recommend 10K or 18F for all compressors, low temperature, medium temperature, and parallel compressors. Wow. That's, that is what we recommend. But there is a but. <laughs> Always, I love it. For this dry expansion system, why do we need this superheat? Let's think about why we need it. We need this to prevent liquid return mainly liquid hammering. We made a lot of investigation and a lot of improvement on the tribology of the compressor, on the super finishing of many components that are able to tolerate lower superheat than that. And in particular, this has come as a must for overfed system or pumped system. In this kind of system, you have to play with no superheat. Otherwise, you are losing energy efficiency. That is what you are doing ejector system for or pump the system for. If you look at a system using ejectors, the scope of, I hope you are familiar with that. If you are not, I can explain this uh, diagram. Yeah, you can. But, it, it, uh, we we do have uh, Dan Foss, Patrick Clarity diving in deep on ejectors. So anyone who's listened to this podcast, head to, I think it's session twelve. But I'll, I'll I'll fix that up. But you can do a quick synopsis of how the ejector works. Perfect. So basically, uh, one of the main scope of the ejector is to lift the medium temperature evaporation pressure. 
when you work with the superheat at the outlet of an evaporator, you are losing efficiency. You are wasting your coil surface with latent heat, which is not so effective. You want to continue having liquid in your evaporator. And doing that, clearly, the compressor is at risk with liquid. However, let's assume this coil here is getting only liquid. Liquid will continue to flow into this generously side low pressure receiver. This low pressure receiver will have a level control that will trigger the operation of an ejector. The ejector will suck the exceeding liquid and bring it to the intermediate pressure receiver pressure level. That's the primary scope of the so-called liquid or overfeeding ejector. But then what will happen to your medium temperature compressor? Basically, what will happen is that the compressor will suck saturated from this receiver with no superheat. And a very similar thing will happen with pumped system. You don't want to heat up too much the suction from your pressure drum up to the compressor suction, otherwise you will lose efficiency. So we have a lot of compressors running with ejector system or pumped system with a lower superheat. And what happens to the compressor? That's very interesting to see. This is a movie showing liquid return test with our compressor that was part of our qualification protocol. In this movie, the compressor is running very dry with no superheat and with some liquid coming back. In the beginning, you will hear a high frequency noise. Don't really bother. This happens when the system is running with a little amount of oil but then this high frequency noise will disappear. But have a look to what happens to this uh, pressure differential gauge. This is measuring live. This is measuring oil differential pressure. You will see that every time liquid is coming back, this gauge will drop down. So lubrication is at risk. Let me play the movie. So you can see oil pressure going down and foaming in the side glass, typical indication that liquid is coming back down and then up. So that's when that liquid yeah. is making its way into the compressor. Correct. Down again, and then up again. Why this happens? Because CO2 is a great detergent, is a great cleaner. So it flashes away the oil film within the compressor and therefore the oil pump is no longer able to develop a correct pressure. Testing in this way, according to our qualification protocol, makes it possible to provide an extra safety margin whenever your system is running with a lower superheat. And again, this is why we have packed our compressor with combustion engine solutions especially when it comes to super finishing with a specific coating, with self-lubricating surfaces that are making the compressor much longer lasting when the system is not running exactly as it should be running. So with your compressors, are they all, do they all have a positive displacement pump? Not some... all of them, okay. only, uh, let's say, starting from 10 horsepower, they do. Okay. And this would be an example of, of that. This is one is with a pump, this example this here? This was with a pump, yeah. Yep. I can, you can see it 
over here. Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay. That's that's super cool to know just to see that that every time the differential pressure changes, there's liquid coming back. And this right, was right? this was just while you you're really just hooked up checking your net oil pressure at that point, right? And that's what's right. jumping around. So to anyone who is listening, if you're checking your net oil pressure and you see it dropping down and changing dramatically like that, there could be a sign of uh, liquid refrigerant. Well, you see it in the sight glass anyway. You, you've seen it there. When you get foaming in the sight glass, um, you get, it's a good chance that you get liquid refrigerant coming back. And you always got to check. You always got to use your tools and check to make sure because you can see the end bell. It's freezing there. This one is an actual application where it's flooding back. But I've seen compressors where they're frozen up, and I thought that it must be flooding back or low super heat, but it's not. It's just so cold and high humidity in that room that it's starting to freeze some ice on the compressor. Always check your super heat. That's really cool. I, I like seeing that. And so when you're in that overfeed system, so you're running at a lower super heat. Here we're showing super heat and flooding back happening. What are the parameters you need to look for where the compressor can run below 10 degrees um, Kelvin or 18 degrees Fahrenheit and still not damaging the compressor? Does there have to be a certain discharge temperature, a certain oil temperature, certain pressures and SST to be able to go different than those uh, ones that you explained? Oil pressure is the driver. Okay in our case, because with this external manifold that you can also see here, with this external manifold, discharge temperature is no longer needed to heat up the lubricant. The discharge plenum is far from the oil, so we don't need that to heat up the lubricant. So there is little to no connection between the discharge temperature and the oil temperature. That is what typically, that's typically the reason why you need to have a certain discharge temperature. Or you have a lower threshold for the discharge temperature. That's because you need to heat up your lubricant with the discharge temperature because the discharge temperature is felt by the lubricant as the discharge plenum is close to the lubricant. But in our case, it is not like that. Interesting. So you, there is no minimum oil discharge temperature requirement, not at all. So in this case, when OEMs are designing, say, an overfeed system, they would test um, the oil pressure and then make sure that it doesn't go below a certain amount of differential in their testing? We do supply with every compressor, we do supply an oil differential pressure switch that is stopping the compressor if it works for more than 90 seconds with a differential pressure lower than 14.5 pounds. So you have a protection in it. And so that Correct. there, when that goes off, I guess it will stop the contactor or go into the Kerwan. Would it go into yes. Kerwan? Correct. Okay. And so now, all of a sudden, if you start to get that differential pressure that goes below 14.5, that could be an indication of liquid coming back to that compressor. And it Correct. Checks. Is there anything else that will, could make that differential go down below 14.5? Where, where? Yeah. if you have a, a high amount of wear within the drive gear, then you will experience a pressure drop, sure. And also, I guess if you're have an oil leak, maybe you don't have any oil in sure. there. Sure, yeah, yeah. Here. Be another no example oil. of yeah. the two. Correct. Awesome. Man, and uh, I can't believe we only have 10 minutes left. Like, <laughs> I'm just getting started. Maybe here. let me spend a little moment on an additional advantage in having this external discharge manifold. Yeah, go ahead. Having, <clears throat> having this manifold outside the crankcase enables you to have a very big volume available. 
you are not confined into the housing. You have a lot of space available outside the compressor housing. So this works like a real muffler. You know, the, the, you have a said that when you have pressure pulsations or vibrations, it is always useful to add volumes here and there. And this is exactly the case because the external discharge manifold is working like a real muffler. You have a big volume available where the gas speed is dropping down dramatically and therefore pressure or gas pulsations are much lower. So the operation of our compressor will be much smoother and with much lower vibration levels. Let me make an example from, okay, you see now a yellow compressors. Don't really care about that. You know, sometimes customer make strange questions, but uh, that's the way it is. Yeah. And you can see four coins on the compressor standing vertical. And now you will hear the compressor running. We don't have any sound. I don't think there's any sound coming through, but that's uh, okay. Let me do this way. Not even now? No, that's okay. I'm sorry about that. No, that's fine. But anyway, you, uh, I think everybody has a LinkedIn account. We have this hashtag, compressor coin challenge. And uh, basically you will find uh, several examples with our compressor running on coins standing vertical. Clearly it doesn't make sense to put coins on compressor, but it gives you an idea of the smooth running. And also you will hear a very smooth sound from the compressor. Technical explanation is again, an external discharge manifold. Makes sense. And that's pre pretty pretty neat. Um, just to, to understand that all that gas that would be trapped in that smaller area of the compressor, now you have that extra space. Correct. But there's multiple there's so there's multiple things with that uh, that plenum, right? You get lower discharge temperatures, and, or it's not affecting the oil temperature, which is one good thing. Lower oil temperature, yes. Oil, no, oil. No, yeah. And then less noise, less pulsation, which is very important because I've seen, and this is not, you know, a compressor manufacturer's fault, but I've seen it multiple times. Technicians send me pictures where the discharge line broke or busted or the suction line broke. Um, and that's sometimes due to the way that the rack was manufactured, or the system was manufactured. But if you have a, a compressor that can reduce that even a little bit more, that might protect it that much longer. Right. Awesome. That Maybe awesome. oil carryover was interesting. Yeah. I will try to make it very short. Oh, we can go in a few extra minutes if that's okay with you, because I know you're taking the time out of uh, your evening to hang out with us. No worries. So oil carryover. Why do we have oil carryover in compressors? What is the reason? If you look at this uh, section of the compressor, you can see the oil sump, the oil filter, the oil is sucked by the pump and then is pumped into the drive gear, into the shaft. And then when reaching the last bearing, oil is coming out, is sprayed out from the last bedding set and is entrained by the suction gas and is then brought into the compression chamber. That is the main reason for having oil ent entrainment, for having oil carryover from the compressor to the system. So what we did is, let's say that's the typical configuration where the gas is entraining the lubricant and bringing the lubricant into the compression chamber. 
we have developed a new design, a new gas passage that is basically bypassing the main oil throw area as we have been modifying the housing with this additional partition into the housing that is assembled with interference with the electric motor and is stopping the lubricant, impeding the gas to entrain the lubricant in the main oil throw region. If you look at the two solutions aside, previous gas passage and new gas passage. So basically we are doing a bypass between the refrigerant stream and the main oil throw area. Clearly, it works like a kind of internal oil separator, but still some oil is escaping. If you see this from a 3D with an animation, this is how it works. Again, we are going inside the compressor and in this area, you will find the suction gas passage on top of the compressor. So the suction gas is bypassing the area where the oil has been thrown out after the last bearing set. So you see here the gas passage and you see here the last bearing set, which is more toward the cylinder heads. So basically a lot of oil is kept within the housing and is not escaping the compressor. What we have been measuring in this way is a very strong oil carryover reduction. It is very difficult to measure oil carryover to give a number, let's say, but we have been measuring the amount of oil calls, how many times the compressor was calling oil in the same period of time with the same operating conditions. And we have been measuring up to 50% reduction in oil calls from the oil separator. Now that's huge. Now that's huge. Now that's less oil out in the system because you don't need really oil in the system. You need oil at the <laughs> compressor. <laughs> Correct. And oil is very expensive, very Correct. expensive. That's super, super cool. What are some of the things that cause higher oil carryover? So you did this de design here for, for anyone that maybe have those. Calling yeah, a strong, the largest influence is given by suction superheat. If you're running with low suction superheat, then you will experience a high oil carryover and clearly revolution speed. If you are going beyond 60 hertz up to 70 or 80 hertz, you will have a higher oil carryover for sure. Yeah. Is there so many topics I want to talk, want to, talk to you about? What's the range of your compressors? Because a lot of compressor manufacturers, depending on the model of compressors, will have a different hertz range. Um, what, what is the ones for, uh, Doreen? Uh, 30, 30 to 70, 70. Okay. And that's for all, all models, I guess, or close to that? Let's say if you need to overspeed beyond 60 Hertz, then we recommend to use the larger motor version for the same displacement. Okay. Like all manufacturers, we have two motor versions for the same displacement. And uh, let's say the larger motor version will be the one recommending for going beyond the grid frequency. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Okay, th th this has been amazing. Screen. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. This has been amazing. Why, um, I think we need to do another another one of these at some point when, when I can find you again. Uh, and we do still have a few more minutes, but I wanna make sure that people can find out, 
find you, connect with you, find more about Dorin, where they can get the, the software, how to find it. And you did show it earlier, but I'd like you to explain that to, uh, to everyone again so, so they can either get in touch with you, get in touch of, with your company, as well as the software. Sure. Actually, you can play with our selection software, which is running online now. You do not have to install any Windows package. You can do this with your iPhone, iPad, or PC, just having a good connection, selection.dorin.com. That's the address. And with our software, you will be able clearly to work with single compressor, but also do complete system design. You can do flash gas bypass system, you can do parallel compression, you can do gas ejectors, liquid ejectors, heat recovery, and HVAC integration. It is very user-friendly. I mean, that is the one. You go back to the refrigeration system, you do booster, and then you do flash gas bypass or parallel compression, and you see a parallel compressor popping up. You do ejectors, you do partial heat recovery, you do intermediate heat exchanger, an internal heat exchanger, you can do air conditioning, then you do low temperature with a desuperator, all sort of stuff. So cool. So cool. Now, this is what, if you're out there and you're a designer, you're an engineer, even if you're a technician, this is something to go look at. And when you were clicking the buttons, it was adding that feature to a diagram to give you a visual look on, okay, just add a parallel compressor. It added it to that diagram, which is really cool because that a lot of people need to see it to get a better understanding on how that system works. So that's, that's awesome. Any, any final words uh, for the audience? I'm going to tried my hardest to get you on again so we can talk about a few other things because there is a lot. No worries. I just will type here. So contact details. Uh, excellent. So this is uh, anyone watching it uh, can get. But I will. I can put this presentation into our chat box if I am allowed. Yeah, so sure. We can. Yeah, somebody, uh, my friend Andre, out in New Zealand says uh, this had been a very informative uh, session. We must have over a hundred Durin compressors on our racks, and have not had uh, many issues at all. Happy That's pretty awesome. Hear. Yeah. Thank you. So Giacomo, I know that you're on LinkedIn, so you can probably reach out to him on LinkedIn. His email was there for anyone who's listening. Uh, G Pisanio, uh, G dot P I S A N O at Dorin D uh, O R I N dot E U for anyone who's listening. Man, this has been awesome. This has been awesome. I learned a ton. I got two pages of notes. I hope the people that are listening, uh, where it was taken as much notes as I've been because I've learned a lot. Hopefully you learned a lot. Um, once again, Giacomo, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, I'll see everyone at the next CO2 Mondays. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hey, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you got something out of it, something that you can use in your daily life. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and click the bell button because when you do click the bell button, it will notify you anytime new videos are released. Also, check out the Refrigeration Mentor webpage at refrigerationmentor.com where I'll have all the different trainings, upcoming events, the different podcasts I've been on, as well as the Refrigeration Mentor podcast. If you want to check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google, any service provider of your choice. Super excited to see you at the next video. Now let's get a conversation going.